I'm not giving in to fear Cause you're the voice of truth that leads me home So I'm singing Welcome to Inver Hills Church. If you're visiting here for the first time, we welcome you. We're excited that you're here. We don't think it's an accident. We pray that you would have divine encounters with the Lord. And for those of you that are watching online, thank you for joining us. You are a part of the service as well. You know, in pre-service prayer, something that we do every Sunday is the intercessors get together and they ask the Holy Spirit, what does he have? What do you have for the service today? And you know what? One of our intercessors had two visions. One of the vision was the church in a train. And they were just looking outside at the countryside and they were just observing. And then the second vision was the church in a bullet train that was focused and going fast and had a vision for what God wanted to release. Then the next picture, was the church going out like the spies did, the 12 spies did, into the land. But every single member that came back had a good report. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? God has good things in store for this body to reach a nation, to reach the world for Jesus. So stand with me as we get ready for worship. Holy Spirit, come. Come in your presence and your power and do whatever you want to do today. We pray that we would have ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning and happy 4th of July, guys. Welcome to church. We invite you to put your hands together as we celebrate Independence Day and our dependence on God. Sing this out with me. You can have my yes with no exception. I'm laying down my right to second guessing. You can have my yes. I'm giving you my fear of never knowing. What's coming next? I know, I know you've got me. You can have my yes. Oh, you're the lamp, you're the light, you're the cloud that guides me. You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life inside me. You've conquered my fears. I leave it all behind. I'm running to the light. My dreams and my ambitions Your presence is my prize and my provision I'll answer when you ask Who could come against if you are for me? Cause even in the fire, I know you've got me I'm giving you my yes again you're the cloud that guides me You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life inside me You've conquered my fears And I'm leaving all behind I'm running to the light Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go Sing it with me Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow you. I'll follow 
wherever you are. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. Wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. Oh, wherever you are, wherever you want to go, I'll follow. I'll follow you. You can live, you can like, you can come to death. You can live, you can truth, you can lie.
darkness you fill me with peace give her mercy you're my help in time of need Lord I can't help but sing sing it out faithful faithful you are faithful
adventure when I allow the Spirit to lead me. Amen. No why, but this time when I turned it on, I felt like I was turning on an accordion. But anyway, thank God it was not true. Um, I was in jail this morning. It's just a public confession. Um, it was the first time we've had jail service in, man, I think it's close to 18 months. And it's the first time Dakota County opened. So when we got down there, John and I, they were like, um, who are you guys? And I was like, well, Pastor Bart. So what are you here for? I go, a service. He's like, oh, we don't allow services on, you know, on Sundays. I was like, What? I go, we're here for the service. He goes, oh, I'm sorry that we don't let you. And he goes, oh, church, church. We had a little language problem. <laughs> I was just like, he goes, well, when I think service, he goes, I mean service like they're working on the cells, they're working on the computer system. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I was speaking Christianese. So, yeah, we're here for church. But um, it was even set up different. They only let two of the five blocks in and all quadrant off, and we have to wear their masks. It was just, just, but it was like a breakthrough for us and them to actually be able to have live service again. And I think, God woke me up at four in the morning. I was all set to do the message I had here, there. You know, that works really good. I get a chance to do it before I come here. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's Independence Day. It's all about freedom. So at 4 a.m., he was downloading a message on freedom that was just for them. And um, it's just exciting to see some of the doors opening again. Amen? Amen? And when I started hearing about their situation during the pandemic, I mean, the gym is closed down. Workout area is closed down. No visitors. I mean... I'm surprised we haven't heard any advocacy for them because it's, it's been incredibly 
difficult for them. And uh, it was so great to be there. Please be praying for those that are incarcerated. Um, and, and they've suffered the full brunt of, of whatever the pandemic restrictions have been. But, um, well, it's offering time. I just, you know, the Bible says make a joyful or, or give joyfully. So I thought maybe there'd be a, you know, hoot and a holler. But there are three different ways you can give. Um, we do have a plate in the back on your way out. And I'm going to remind you, it's also change offering. First Sunday of the month, that change, the children will come down with their cans to collect. And all that goes to feed my starving children. And we are so, I was, I was like, couldn't believe it. My roommate moved out and took off to Austin, Texas. The only thing left in the bedroom was this wooden tray of all of his change. So I was going to give him grief and go, where, where does that fit in the car? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. That needs to go to feed my starving children. And I was bummed that I didn't bring it because it would fill like two of those pails. So next month, you know, I'm going to have it up here and I'll just have the kids come up and I'll just fill those pails. If you don't have change, that's fine. You can put in cash. But um, we do that. We also have an app um, uh, that, that makes it easy for you to give online. I'm amazed at through the pandemic how that took us through when we went from 20% on the app to about 70% giving that way. And then also you can go to our website. But God, we just thank you oh, that you are Jireh. <laughs> you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And God, you provided, Lord, for the church through the pandemic, through, for missions through the pandemic, for hurting families through the pandemic. And now, God, as we trust, we've come out the other side, Lord, that your provision continues to go before us. And we just thank you that, Lord, you tell us in a chapter where you, you, you talk to us, Jesus, about being concerned about what we eat, what we drink, what we wear. And you said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all that stuff. He's going to take care of that. And Lord, I thank you for your provision. I pray you bless each gift and each giver in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's what's happening at Everhills Church. Coming up soon, Friday, July 9th is soccer night, and everyone is welcome to attend. Feel free to join the game or sit on the sidelines and cheer everyone on. Men, hope you're hungry this month. Saturday, July 10th, is a hearty men's breakfast served at 9 a.m. here at the church. Then, the men's barbecue is happening Wednesday, July 14th at 6 p.m. at the home of John Schley. Please bring something to grill and a side dish to share. Please sign up for one or both events in the lobby. And ladies, time for a coffee break. Meet us Saturday morning, July 24th at 9 to try out the new Oivita Lifestyle Cafe in Invergrove Heights. No sign-up is necessary. We'll just see you there. On Sunday, July 18th, for our Sunday service, we are honored to have Michael French, Director of Patria Ministries. Michael has an incredible prophetic ministry and teaches on biblical dream interpretation. He is also leading the ordination service for Pastor Bart and Pastor Lisa. After church, everyone is welcome to a picnic for a great time of fellowship and celebration. And finally, a big thank you to those who showed up this past week to help with Saturate Invergrove Heights. More door hanger bags were stuffed and distribution has begun. We look forward to you helping on our next Saturate Night. This week's power verse is Acts 4.31. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. <laughs> well, <clears throat> good morning. And I have in my, you know, my folder just one of these. And I want to thank you guys who, who went out and distributed them. If, uh, and I, I, you know, part of me, I was a part of this in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, but it's been a long time. And I remember when we, we were approached by saturation and 
They said somebody's paid to get a Jesus DVD in every household across America. But for 18 months, we've been trying to find somebody who would do the two zip codes in Invergrove Heights. And I was like, well, we'll do it. And then I hung up the phone and I was like, well, there's 15,000 door hangers. <laughs> so if you didn't get a chance to go out last time, there are going to be plenty more chances as the summer goes on. And, you know, if you, there's three different versions of the, the Jesus film on here. There's also the invitation to the church, but on the back side, there's information about Chosen and how they can just download a free app on their phone and watch The Chosen, which is an incredible modern-day uh, depiction, uh, really, of the Jesus film, and it's still being created in season two. But it's getting the message of the gospel out, and what it did for me was think about, hmm, why does it bother me? I mean, we become a society where it's very common to have no solicitation signs on our door. Don't bother me. But what we were asking you to do is very discreetly hang this on the door and are you bothering somebody when you leave them the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or are you caring about them? You know, um, as I said, I, I woke up at four in the morning and I'm like, and part of it was um, we, we didn't have a guitar player. And so not only was I going to the jail for the first time in 18 months, it was going to be, I get to lead a cappella at 8.30 in the morning. And that, that's like right up there in my least favorite things to do. But I needed to come together with, you know, three songs that I could lead a cappella. And um, the only one I had was the one we normally do, which is Amazing Grace. You know, my chains are gone. And I'm like, okay, what else? What else? I wouldn't get anything. And then I get, woke up at four in the morning and it's like, it's just like the Holy Spirit, the first thing he says is, it's Independence Day. And so I'm sitting there praying and God has given me this message for the jail and, and I was like, God bless America. We've got to do God bless America. And then there's the battle hymn of the Republic. We've got to do that. And so I came here and, you know, we haven't had hymnals in the pews for quite a few years, but we, they are hidden in places around the building. And so I grabbed the last two hymnals we had and I, I looked in both of them. Now, these cover the last, like, 65 years. This church has been around for 76 years. Neither one of them had God Bless America in it. It was like, the, what, this, is, this is God Bless America. You think it would be in a hymnal. But no. God Bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God Bless America, my home sweet home. I mean, come on. It's like reminding us, and this is what I think about saturate. What are you doing? You're blessing America with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And saturate has been at this now for a little over a year, about 18 months. And, and the first two places that they actually saturated was New York and New Jersey. And the ministries attached to doing this have been doing evangelism for 45 years, and they said they have never seen the results like they're seeing now. People open to the gospel. So let's bless America with the message of Jesus Christ. Amen? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has trampled out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has focused, or I'm sorry, he has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword, his truth is marching on. John has all of these verses memorized. You go, John. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with the glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. He, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. His truth is marching on. See, we need to be reminded, okay, that the battle of independence was initiated by people paid to come over here and try to find a new land where we could have freedom of religion. And it's the freedom of truth, the freedom of religion, the freedom to worship that people gave their lives for. And I think today we get confused about what the battles are, who the enemy is, and we need to be reminded it's good and evil, and we stand for truth, and the truth shall set you free. It says, I have read the fiery gospel with its burnished rows of steel, as ye deal with my condemners, so with you my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman crush the serpent with his heel. 
His truth is marching on. And he has sounded forth a trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer. Oh, be jubilant, my feet. His truth is marching on. Before I get into today's message, I'm just going to ask you to stand with me and join me in praying for our nation on this Independence Day. God, I just thank you for a country that I grew up in, Lord, where I could learn that people gave their lives so that I could express this freedom that we have right here, that I could, I could worship you as I see fit. But Lord, we were created as one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Lord, I pray that you would saturate this nation with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ so we can come together in the oneness and the unity that you created us to walk in, God. Lord, that we would be reminded that we are created in the image of God. We are to reflect your truth, your grace, your love, and fight for your freedom. So, Lord, not only can we be set free in this life, but the life to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. We are in the Holy Spirit series, and the, the title today is a little misleading because it came out of one of my devotionals. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit in one specific facet today, and that is the presence of God. And the title is Presence Always Wins Over Principle. And I was reading in my morning devotions, uh, and I can't even remember which one person I happened to be reading from because I, I, I read from like three different books uh, four, including the Bible. <laughs> um, but this phrase just jumped off the page at me. And I, I'm doing these things live, which may change in time because you can't move them from live Facebook over to YouTube and, you know, whatever. You know, who in the world would have ever thought that I'd be recording and then pandemic hit? But um, as I'm reading this live and I get to this phrase, presence, his presence always wins over principle. And I wanted to just stop and argue that over in my mind, you know? It was like, wait a minute. I can look over my lifetime. I accepted Christ before I was five years old. I was aware of his presence at a very young age. As when you accept Jesus, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, comes in you. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. And you can be aware of the very presence of God and I look over my life, and I can, I can pretty much mark every bad decision from a decision that happened when I wasn't paying attention to the presence of God. And that is how significant the presence of God is. It is so significant that not only did Jesus come to die for you, but he had to ascend and leave the earth so that the promise of God, the Holy Spirit, his presence could come and be with you and guide you every moment of your life. The Holy Spirit is the presence. He's the very presence of God that was in the Holy of Holies, in that blue flame between the cherub and upon the Ark of the Covenant as a part of the cover called the mercy seat of God. Now we experience him and his presence is here just as it was in heaven. Why? Because Jesus came and died and paid a price for our sin and the curtain was rent and the presence was released. But back then you had to be the high priest. Once a year you went in, if you weren't holy, the bells on the bottom of your priestly garments stopped jingling and they knew that they needed to pull on the rope and pull your dead body out because you were not holy enough to be in the presence of God. And now the presence of God resides in you. In Genesis 4.16, Cain was escorted out of the presence of God. I was, I was just doing a study of the word presence and God and I, I was just like, I never in all my times, 50 some plus reading through the Bible, Genesis probably over a hundred times, I didn't ever remember that phrase. It was not significant until I started doing this, this, this series and focusing on it. And it says, Cain was escorted out of the presence of God east of Eden. Think about that. You see, Jesus came to restore us to right relationship with God. Part of that right relationship was walking in the very presence of God. What did Adam and Eve do in the cool of the evening? They walked with God in the garden. They were in his very presence. And so when Cain sinned and killed his brother, he was escorted out of the presence. And that's what happens with sin. Because God could not reside with sin. That's why Jesus had to come. Aaron would go before the presence and face of Jehovah. 
And, and that's the thing is in the Old Testament, the word for presence most of the time, a lot of times, meant that you turned yourself toward the face of God. Now we know, and it, I just read it again in my own devotions in the New Testament, that you can't look on the face of Jehovah and live. But the presence, the, the, the face, the experience of God was being in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The word uh, for presence used almost exclusively means to stand before, to, to peer into the face, to turn yourself toward. When God presented himself to us, it is by or through his Holy Spirit. We gaze upon the glory of his goodness through the Holy Spirit. Like, oh, uh, my, my dad um, was the president of the Luther League of the biggest Lutheran church in our town. And in our town, I mean, there was one Catholic church, one holy, in fact, it was holy rosary. I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea. I was like, holy rosary, what a stupid name. I didn't know until I'd gone to Bible college what the rosary was. And then I was like, oh, that's not such, that's not such a stupid name. But they would have a thousand people on Saturday night in mass. They'd have another 600 maybe at, at one of the masses in the morning and maybe 400 at the other one. I mean, it was a town of 5,800. It's like over half of them are in the Catholic Church. But then there was like seven Lutheran churches. And the biggest, it ran five or 600. And the rest of them had at least that much membership. You know, and, and so either you were Catholic or you were Lutheran or you were weird. And we were weird as we were Assembly of God the other side of the tracks. Back then, it was in your sociology book in high school text as a sect, not a cult, but the next step over was the Assemblies of God. Not almost a cultic, but not quite, but not a denomination. But that's where I was. But here's my dad, and he was the president of their youth group. And he went to a Sunday night service with my mom, and he explained how, I mean, his mom was the president of the WCTUs. That's how Lutheran they were. Okay? I mean, in 1955, it would have been, she was still a proud president of the WCTUs. When was prohibition lift, lifted? I mean, this is way before my time. It was long before 55, right? And she's still running an organization set up by the church about prohibition. And he went to this Sunday night service, and he gave his heart to the Lord. Now, his mom was heartbroken because she thought every Lutheran gave their heart to the Lord at the end of confirmation, because she did. And he's like, no, Mom, I didn't. I just finished confirmation. But that night when he accepted Christ, he said a peace came over him and in him, and when he walked out, he saw the world in technicolor, as before he saw it black and white. And I bring that testimony up because that's what the presence of God living in you does. It transforms how you see everything because now you can see through the eyes of Christ. Now, is that what happened with the presence of God when he was in the Old Testament? Well, it is the Holy Spirit. The presence, it says, of a fire warms you and it illuminates everything around you. And that's a good description of what the Holy Spirit does supernaturally. It warms you and it illuminates everything around you. It also illuminates the word of God for you. One of the first things Jesus did with his disciples was pray that they would receive the Holy Spirit so they could get the right interpretation of the word of God. In 1 Kings 8, 9 or 10 through 11, it says, when the priests came out of the holy place, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. The priests could not continue their service because of the cloud, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. One more segue back to my dad, because I'm a rabbit trailer, and I started that one and didn't realize what the end hole was, and it was the fact that he grew up in the Lutheran church, he accepted Christ, and he got filled with the Holy Spirit, and now his whole life is going to the cafes at 85 years old and talking to everybody he can find and saying, you can't ignore the Holy Spirit. He goes, you know, it was about God and the Father, but there's, or God and Jesus, and there's not enough about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what makes you experience God. And he's like this 85-year-old, you know, promoter of the, the Holy Spirit. Why? 
Well, mom left over 11 years ago. So he's left alone in that house, and guess who comforts him? Guess who counsels him? Guess who is there with him? The Holy Spirit. So it means way more to him now than it ever did before. Holy Spirit presence and David. Let's look at this. In Psalms 51, 10 through 11, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I love that song. I love that psalm. I prayed it all the time. I still do. I sing it. But it's the next line. Do not banish me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David was unique in the Old Testament. I mean, he did things that only priests could do. He was known as a man after God's own heart. He was also known as somebody who always strengthened himself in God. He was a worship leader, and he was a worshiper, both instrumentally and vocally, as a little boy on. He was unique this way, and he demonstrated such an incredible acute awareness of the importance of walking in the presence of God, and that is in the Holy Spirit. In Psalm 1611, it says, You will show me the way of life granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Psalms 26, 8, I love your sanctuary, Lord, the place where your glorious presence dwells. This is called a sanctuary. But where the sanctuary of the Lord is for any believer is any place that they go. Because the presence of God is in you and goes with you, and he doesn't change. You're the one that turns up or turns down the volume of his presence in your life. And if you don't feel him, it's time to stop and whatever you're doing and turn the volume of the Holy Spirit back up because he is there to guide you. He is your counselor. Like I was saying in the jail today, I said, you know, when Jesus said, I have to go so the promise of God can come, I said, you know what he calls him? He calls him, I'm going to send you an advocate. But I said, it's actually paraclete, which is actually... I'm going to send you legal counsel. <laughs> and he's the Holy Spirit. Please listen to him, because if you listen to him, you'll walk the path of truth and righteousness, and you'll be empowered by God, and you'll know his peace. But if you don't listen to him, we'll be talking again soon. God sent the Holy Spirit so you could not only be set free, but walk in freedom. And yet so many believers, they get saved. They're like, oh, I'm not going to hell. And then they go back to their daily routine. And they live in misery. And, and then they have these moments here, and they're like, oh, thank God I felt the presence of God. Did you feel the presence of God Sunday? Hey, let's go out to dinner. Oh, I had a horrible week, and this happened, this happened. But hey, this morning I felt the presence of God. You can feel the presence of God all the time. You can. If you keep attuned with him, Jesus could not do anything on this earth of himself. He was 100% man, even though he's 100% God. When Jesus prayed for the sick, it was out of obedience of his Father, because he said, Jesus said this, he said, I only do what the Father tells me to do, and I only say what he tells me to do. So Jesus is a man, a human example to us. Yes, the Son of God came to earth to die for our sins, but as far as his ministry went, he was a human being. And he prayed for the sick. So how did they get healed? For the Holy Spirit came upon him. That's why he can say to you, see these things I did? You can do these and even more. Because my spirit is going to come and not only rest upon you, but be in you. Oh, don't get me going. Remember what I said about the light and the warmth. In Psalms 56, 13, this is how David describes it. For you have rescued me from death. You have kept my feet from slipping. So now I can walk in your presence, O God, in your life-giving light. In Psalms 89, 15, he says, Happy are those who hear the joyful call to worship, and they will walk in the light of your presence, Lord. If you're not sure where to go, stop until you feel the presence of God and then only continue when you're still in that peace. Psalms 139, 1 through 7, O Lord, you've examined me. One of my favorite, if not my favorite psalm, 
Lord, you, you examine me. You show my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down and I stand up. You know my thoughts. Even when I'm far away from you, you see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. I wish I give you permission to stop it. Anyway, you go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. This is the heart of David. This is why he was who he was. This is why he's called the man after God's own heart, because he followed God's own heart by following the presence of God, by calling it into his life, by praying five times a day. Because David knew how to identify and walk in the glorious presence of God, the Holy Spirit presence on Saul. Yeah, on Saul. The Israelites didn't want a prophet, a priest anymore. They wanted a king. So what happens in 1 Samuel 10, 6 and 7? And at that time, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and you will be changed into a different person. This is Samuel the prophet's words over Saul, yeah, guess what? He prophesied over Saul that when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he would be changed. And he was. What happened to Saul after that? He started prophesying, and they're like, was he a prophet too? <sighs> when Saul and his servants arrived in Gibeon, they saw the group of prophets coming toward them. Then the Spirit of God came powerfully upon Saul, and he too began to prophesy. Now, I would say it went to his head. <laughs> and he started to operate outside of the Holy Spirit and in doing so brought harm to him and the nation. And God said, I'm going to look for a man after my own heart. Somebody who follows the presence of God. See, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Holy Spirit's presence on Moses, Ezekiel 13, 21, and 22. The Lord went ahead of him. He guided them through the day with a pillar of cloud and provided light at night as a pillar of fire. There's the light and the warmth again. There's the direction again. All that you receive by the presence of God, the Holy Spirit being in and upon you. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or the pillar of fire from this place in front of the people. In Exodus 33, the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Did Moses ever struggle with that? <laughs> he did. Then Moses said, if you don't personally go with me, I'm not going anywhere. There's wisdom in that. How will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on my people, if you don't go with us? For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from the other people on the earth. There is a profound statement made by Moses that all of us need to highlight. It is God's presence that sets you apart from the world. It's God's presence that leads you in a way of righteousness and not to be conformed to the things of the world. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you ask, for I look favorably on you and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. Oh, show me your glory, Lord. And the Lord replied, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will call out, um, and I will call out my name, Yahweh, before you. For I will show mercy to anyone I choose, and I will show compassion to anyone I choose. Now you realize that what he saw was the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit in Gideon. Somebody was already messing with Judges 6 a couple weeks ago. Then the Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. I love that. Or as it is, can be translated in the Hebrew, he put him on like a glove. You know... I mean, if you have to make a choice between being possessed by the devil or possessed by God, I think I'd rather be possessed by God. And, and when you're doing righteous acts, when somebody comes to you and they're going, what in the world possessed you to hang that on my door? You can just say, God. 
And that's not such a bad thing. But he possessed, he put Gideon on. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms. And the men of the clans of Ebezer came to him. The Holy Spirit was on ba- Bezalel there, whatever. Yeah, the craftsman that was appointed and chosen to build uh, the temple of the Lord for Solomon. And it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen this guy, son of Uri, or the tabernacle, grandson of Hur in the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God. It's interesting because we see language that theologically we were taught didn't happen. You know, if you are taught dispensationalism, then you were taught that in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit only came upon them, but in the New Testament he came into you on the day of Pentecost. And he did come into us on the day of Pentecost. But I think we need to learn lessons as we're reading Scripture that we can't put parameters on what God can do, whether it was 4,000 years ago or today. And if he decides he wants to fill somebody for a season, he can do that. Now with Samson, with so many others, the Holy Spirit came upon them. He anointed them for a moment, for a purpose, for a season. But in some cases, he filled them. And why, why did he have to fill this guy? Well, I have filled him with the Holy Spirit, giving him great wisdom, ability, and experience in all kinds of crafts. This guy was pointed to be the master craftsman of the tabernacle of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit came in and took residence, all right, and became the the hard drive and the software to give him the blueprint and the CAD system to build the tabernacle of God. My interpretation. He's skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and carving wood. He is a master at every craft. Anointed for the task, anointed for the time. God anoints ordinary willing people with his presence, with his Holy Spirit supernaturally empowering them to serve him. Did you get that? If there's something in your life that you feel God is calling you to, but you go, God, I don't have the strength to do it, guess what? He does. And if he's called you, he's already prepared you. He's already equipped you. And if you've been to Brian Fenimore's class, I love the teaching on destiny that he he used to describe that God goes before you. He sets up the circumstance. Then he backs up his truck with provision waiting for you. He does the 80 or 90%. All you got to do is step up and do your 10% and ask, and you will receive and be empowered to do what he's called you to do. So every one of those God encounters in your daily life where all you need to do is love on somebody, an act of kindness, God's already given you the provision. He's already prepared your heart, and he's prepared them to receive. You just got to step in obedience. And how do you do that? By the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He anoints you for a task, for a time, and he anoints anyone who calls upon his name. And the, New Te- and the Old Testament, for the most part, he rested upon them. In Acts 1.8, though, he said this. <sighs> Go and Terry, go and wait in God's presence. Go and wait and come into one accord, not a Honda. What it meant was come into agreement of spirit, that all of you need God's power to do what I asked you to do. But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when he comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I uh, had a little accident and so I couldn't go with on Wednesday Um, kind of funny but I was knocked out by the cross literally big old rugged cross that we bring in and uh, it's got these big there's about seven inches exposed of the big spikes and something was stuck in the garage and I you know I called it when I picked myself up off the cement that I I pulled a Thompson. <laughs> it's like, well, it's not going to move. Well, I'll make it move. So I just grabbed that sheet of sheetrock and I just jerked while it was stuck between a wood frame of what used to be a sound panel. And the bottom of that wood frame was underneath the, the base of the cross. And so when I jerked, that cross catapulted down and hit me right here. And my natural instinct was to turn in, but the spike hit me right here. Had I turned in, I'd be a pirate today. And so I turned away, and the spike went right down this way. And I'm still bruised, but uh, uh, Wednesday, when I thought that maybe that I could do this, you know, I couldn't do this. Um, And so you guys went out, and I wanted to go out. I'm like, God, it's hypocritical for me not to be out there. 
as I got an ice pack on my face. And uh, I looked at the video today and I watched you. I looked at the pictures that were on Facebook. And I saw a radiant glow of the presence of God on everyone that was going door to door, adults and kids. I saw the joy of the Lord on them. You see, you don't go out alone. And the enemy, the last thing he wants you to do is to do anything in the name of Jesus. And so he's going to intimidate you. Remember 1 Timothy? Or 2 Timothy 1.7, I did not give you the spirit of fear, and that word for fear there is the only place in the entire New Testament that word is used, and it means cowardice. Chicken. Bark, bark. That's the only place where it uses that word. It's a word that probably would apply to Gideon when he was in the, you know, he, he was in the wine press hiding threshing grain. And the angel of the Lord came to him and called him what? Anyone? Say it again. Man of mighty valor. Did he look like a man of valor? No, he was hiding in a wine press, treading out grain. He was demonstrating that word for fear, the Greek word. But God called him out for who he was, how God saw him, if he would step into the power of the Holy Spirit. And what happened? In that case, God put him on like a glove, absolutely fitted him with the Holy Spirit. And he won a mighty, mighty victory, 300 men over hundreds of thousands. So step out and watch God put you on like a glove. The difference is, in the Old Testament, he put himself on, he took himself off. In the New Testament, after the upper room experience, he resides in you. He is there. He is, he's, he's a prayer away. He's a moment away. In Matthew 3, 11 and 12, it says, I baptize you with water, John the Baptist said, under repentance for the sin and to turn to God. But someone is coming soon who is greater than I, much greater. I'm not even worthy to be his slave or carry his sandals. And he'll baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Baptism is total immersion, it's saturation, it's filled to overflowing, it's anointing, it's covering. That's why in John 7, 37 through 39, it says, out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. That is the Holy Spirit continuing to flow out of you. In John 20, 20 through 23, it says, he spoke and he showed them the wounds of his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again he said, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So for clarification, when you accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in you. The breath of God, the very life of God comes in you. But then just like he told them to go to the upper room, he asks us to go and tarry. I'll never forget praying many years ago. It's like, God, we need people to get saved. Lord, God, we didn't we go. You know, when the big prayer back then was, uh, you know, we get together corporately, and it's like, pray to the north, pray to the south, you know, pray to the east, pray to the west, you know, and just praying them in, praying them in. And I've been in the sanctuary by myself praying a couple hours, and, oh, God, just send somebody in, when really I think a lot of times the prayer needs to be, God, send us out. Um, but I was praying, God, send them in. And I'm walking down the hallway, in the office, and this guy walks in, and he, he walks up to the pastor, at least his office, because I wasn't in there yet, and he goes, excuse me, she goes, can I help you? Yeah, I need to find, I, I'm here, I, I need somebody to, well, I need to get saved. Would somebody lead me to Christ? I was just like, whoa. I wasn't expecting that prayer to get answered. But you know what I mean? I was in here praying, oh God, please do the impossible. Just, and he walks in, and I remember being up here, and we prayed with him, and he goes, is there any more? I was like a past police, and I said, well, you should pray be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He goes, okay, I want that too. You know, I told him, schedule water baptism. And he said, anything else? Yep. So I went to lay hands on him, and he falls to the floor. And he was never the same again. I mean, the guy got saved, you know, and slam dunked in, in one moment, and he was never the same again. And he was always a joy for me to be around because he was the answer to that prayer that day. And to watch what God could do in a moment. You see... It's about freedom. It's about your independence day. Man, we thought, imagine the forefathers. They, they thought this, this was it. We're going to be one nation under God, live happily ever after. 
And, and then over time, it's been a struggle. Over time, it's the, we, we don't all really share the same concept of freedom. And there's division in the House, and there's division in the Senate, <laughs> and there's division, you know, in the, in the justices, in the courtrooms, and in the cities. But there's no division in the presence of God. Who and what sets you free? The truth. So in what is your true freedom? What is your real independence in? Well, you must be set free first and foremost, and we were set free by the cross of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, he is the way, the truth, and the life, no one gets the Father except through him. But he himself said, now I must go from the earth that I can send my spirit to lead you into all truth, for he is the spirit of truth. And he will say nothing of himself, but he will say everything that I ask of him. So Jesus sends us his Holy Spirit. He is a part of the triune God. He has been and was and always will be. He used to rest upon people, and he still does. There'll be a specific thing that you will be anointed and empowered to do in a moment, but now, through Jesus and because of Jesus, he resides in you. That's the presence of God that can overcome any situation, can take away any panic attack, uh, can, can reduce any fear to ashes, can bring peace to any quarrel. It's more about the presence than the principal people. Just like relationship needs to be more important than your opinion or the principle. The presence needs to be more important than the principle. Is there peace in your relationship? Is there peace in your home? Is there peace at work? Is there peace in your decision making? Even prophetically in pre-service prayer, there was a sense that what God wanted to do today is for some of you, there's something you're wrestling with, something that's broken, something that just isn't working. I mean, I'm, I'm going through this. I spent seven weeks every waking hour that I wasn't here. I was working on my house. We had an agreement for me to buy a different house. And the day before I was going to put my house on the market, the guy I was going to buy from backed out. And I'm, 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 a lot of my stuff is in storage. It's in a trailer. My place is two shades of gray. They call it <laughs> buyer's gray, seller's gray. And I'm looking at it going, is this my home? What's going on? I don't know. And so Father's Day, just before Father's Day when I found that out, and so I went away to the prayer cabins, and I just felt like God just going, do you trust me? Like, well, yeah, but we had an agreement. He goes, yeah, but do you trust me? I'm like, yeah. Well, what's the next step? I'm like, well, do you trust me? Well, yeah. Well, what's the next step? He's like, just trust me. That is what's in my life that I have to give over to God. Because do I want, let's see, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Do I want God in that decision? Absolutely. So what is it that you need to give over to God? And how will you know that God is directing you? Well, he will speak to your heart. He will tell you. He will confirm it. That doesn't mean when you step out to do it, you're not going to face opposition. But remember, he went before you. He's in you. He's waiting for you at that opportunity. You just have to take your 10% and go. So stand with me this morning. You are empowered by the presence of God, who is the Holy Spirit. He's in you. He's on you. He's directing you. But man, if that's speaking to you, if there's a, a life decision, a life situation that you have wrestled with, and I really believe for some of you, you've given this to God, you've taken it back. You've given this to God, you've taken it back. And God's just saying, how about we stop wrestling over this? Right? How about we just take a, a peek at your life and we look at those times where you gave it to me and we look at the times where you took it back. Which one do you prefer? see 
Surrender isn't weakness. It's having the courage to realize that you are better off and not in control. Did you hear me? Surrender to God is not, it's not weakness. But it's the courage to realize that you're much better off with God in control. So if he's speaking to you, I want you to come this morning. Just come right to the altar. We're going to pray. Uh, the offering plates are in the back. The kids will be here with the change offering. Ministry team, if you'd come up. It can be your independence day. You can have freedom from whatever it is that's bo- that is your bondage. You are not the sin that you have committed. You are not the habit that's had you bound. You are a son and daughter of God. And he has an identity for you, and it's in freedom. You just have to surrender to step into that freedom. So come, and and even if you don't at this moment, when I get done praying, the altars will be open. I'll wait here for a few moments as well. God, I just thank you for the... Man, as much as you dying on the cross for us, Jesus, was the most spectacular, incredible thing that no other human could ever do. You had to be perfect. No one else was perfect. So you ascended. You left the throne of God and took on mortality so that we could step back into immortality. But God, even greater than that, you said, I must go so the Spirit can come to empower you like he empowered me so that you can walk in my presence, walk in the very presence of God. So Lord, whatever it is that has separated people from your presence, whatever the habit, whatever the decision, whatever the offense, Lord, I pray that you would just call them back to your presence. And Lord, empower them to put down that offense, put down whatever that situation is, whatever the addiction is, just surrender it to you. And realize that that takes courage which is met with supernatural empowerment by your presence, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.